Welcome to another stocked and loaded episode of the Sports Card Nation podcast. The show that brings you all the important hobby news, discussions, debates, opinions, info, and interviews with key hobby and sports dignitaries. Also, if you're good, you know we are going to give away something. Now, here's the guy that wanted the cards more than the gum. John Newman. What is up? Welcome to episode 153. Happy to be back. Got a great guest today, Mr. Dan Good. Uh, newsman, author, writer, editor, collector, uh, husband of Sue's. Uh, but uh, writing a new book, uh, going to come out in April of 2022 about Ken Caminiti. The 1996 MVP, one of the first gentlemen to, or ball players to, uh, admit to steroid use. And he really kind of did it sort of unpressured. Uh, the ending for, for Ken, unfortunately, was not uh, a Hollywood script, uh, did not end well. But, uh, you know, everything you hear about Ken uh, Caminiti was that he was a. Uh, Really unselfish, great guy that would do anything uh, for his teammates uh, and for people outside the game uh, as well. And, uh, you know, I'm not a, a fan per se, but very fond of that era of baseball. Not not the steroid part, but that era of baseball. And, you know, like it or don't like it, the steroids were a integral part of that era. And this book is going to give you... Sort of a look behind the scenes. But it's also going to give you a a look at Ken Caminiti, uh, the person. And, you know, sometimes we forget with these players, right, that they're they're actually uh, people too, uh, not just athletes. Uh, They have families and lives. And uh, sometimes the story uh, doesn't always have a a great ending. But, uh, you know, looking forward to reading that book. Uh, Glad to have uh, Dan on. We're going to talk about the book, the process of writing the book, uh, his collecting, uh, what he collects, uh, that sort of thing. He's also going to tell you he was the real genius uh, behind some of the stadium club ca- uh, cards you saw at uh, Tops. Uh, Tongue in cheek there. But a great conversation about the sport of baseball, cards. Uh, he's even going to give his sort of thoughts uh, at the end there about. Uh, fanatics as well, where the hobby uh, is going. And this is someone that knows the sports side and the hobby side. And that's not always uh, a common thread. So uh, happy to have uh, Dan on today. I think you'll find the, the conversation uh, intriguing. Uh, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy it. So with that being said, let's get this thing started. Time for this week's product releases. Time for this week's new release product calendar. As always, disclaimer, with some of the pandemic issues and transportation issues, uh, port issues, you know, things may be potentially uh, delayed. But here's the schedule. It's actually a Pretty light week for new releases uh, on the sports side of the house. Today, November 12th, if you're listening to this on show release date, 2021 Panini National Treasures Baseball. Nothing till the 17th of November, which is then 2021 Panini Flawless Collegiate Football. Also on the 17th, 2021 Top Stadium Club Chrome Baseball. And then on the 19th, 2021 Onyx Vintage Extended Series Baseball. So you're looking at about four releases this week. Pretty light. And if there's any delays, uh, going to be even lighter. Let's hope not. So with that being said, uh, choose your weapon and happy ripping. It's time for the Hobby What's Up, where we go around the hobby world 
and tell you all the latest news and breaking stories from the hobby we love. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Good news for our friends to the north. The Toronto Sports Expo is underway. Uh, after a two-year hiatus, obviously uh, due to COVID, uh, the Toronto Sports Expo Expos twice a year, November uh, in May. Uh, unfortunately, Upper Deck and Leaf uh, did not make the trip, uh, but Upper Deck will have representation there. Uh, huge autograph uh, uh, signing list, uh, especially on the hockey end of things. It is a heavy hockey show. I've, I've attended it uh, one time myself, but they have... Other sports cards there as well. But it is heavy hockey. Uh, but glad to see it back as shows uh, start to kick off against a, a well-run, well-produced show. And uh, it was fun times. If um, I just started a new job and uh, if it wasn't for that, I might make that uh, trip. Uh, but maybe next year we can uh, we can go. But uh, uh, plenty, uh, plenty of autograph guests. Uh, usually coincides with the Hockey Hall of Fame uh, announcement and the Upper Deck uh, new Upper Deck Hockey uh, flagship release. That won't happen this year due to uh, some production issues, uh, but still a great show with uh, a lot of great folks and great dealers. It's a pretty good size event as well as someone who's been there in Toronto, one of my favorite cities. Uh, in the world, so uh, I try to get to Toronto for any reason I can. <laughs> UFC has an exclusive autograph and memorabilia deal with the Memento Group. Don't know much about them, just know that the deal is with them. Uh, they're in, uh, through IMG, so if you want any UM, uh, UFC items, you have to go uh, memorabilia. You have to go through uh, Memento Group. National Hobby Shop Day is coming up December 11th, sponsored by GTS Distribution. Uh, all participating LCSs will put on... Uh, a spread. I think there's going to be food, drink, and some promotional cards uh, given it away. Uh, that's at participating uh, LCSs. Uh, please either go to uh, GTS to see which uh, LCSs are participating or ask your local card shop if they're one of those that are. Some late breaking news literally just came across my phone as uh, we were doing this new segment. Alt has received some Series B investment funding, $75 million uh, to be ex exact, to help the platform uh, further grow. Uh, various investors, uh, including Tom Brady and, and many others, Kevin Durant, uh, are part of uh, this uh, seed money, so uh, look for Alt to expand and grow uh, just based on this alone. So uh, we're seeing these big money investments continue uh, across the board uh, in the hobby, and, uh, and uh, that's probably going to continue uh, at this rate. So that's just the latest one. Tops has announced Bundesliga. Series 1 of the 2021-22 NFT cards are available. Uh, the first round, they're going to be a bunch of uh, monthly drops, uh, car carrying some game day footage of top plays, goals, highlights, and players uh, from the current season. Uh, so this uh, has dropped the Series 1. And uh, if you want to check that out, you can go to www.tops nftss.com so tops nfts no apostrophe there dot com
It's a rare week we can do this segment without talking about another break-in at a local car shop. It has happened uh, in Utah. I don't have all the details on that one. Uh, And it's happened now at Game Day Sports Cards in Henderson, Nevada. Uh, They took single cards and wax, uh, smash and grab, uh, got in the back door, smashed some showcases, and filled the bag up and got out. Uh, Suspect uh, remains at large. We talked about uh, the bullpen arm robbery last week. It's come out now that over $1 million worth of sports cards and memorabilia were taken in that bullpen L.A. Uh, robbery. Over, think about that. Over $1 million. Got to think the FBI uh, is probably involved uh, in that now uh, as well. A little update from our sponsor, the uh, guys over at Sports Card Shop at MoCo. Got to, let's finish this segment at least on a high note here. So Rex Gocher, owner of Sports Card Shop at MoCo, says that uh, South Bend police have apprehended uh, a suspect. Now this suspect was accused of the another card shop uh, burglary at uh, Augie's locker room. That's in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, they broke in there. Uh, they uh, have uh, apprehended that sub, uh, suspect. He's been identified as Wayne Hensel Jr. He was a former customer of Augie's, and that's one of the reasons they were able to identify him. Rex tells me that based on video footage from the sports car shop at MoCo and the footage uh, from the other uh, robbery, they believe... Uh, The same suspect, uh, Mr. Hensel, is responsible for both uh, robberies. There was a knit hat that he left at the scene at the sports car shop at MoCo Burglary. They'll be doing DNA testing on that to confirm what they believe is the same gentleman uh, committing both of those burglaries. So uh, hopefully that's the case and uh, Mr. Hensel uh, gets to pay uh, for the crime by doing uh, the appropriate time, and man, we're just we're hearing so many of these stories, and uh, you know, just hope we uh, start hearing less and less uh, of those. The Sports Card Shop is your small town local card shop with a global reach, located in New Buffalo, Michigan. The shop is one of the most accessible in the Midwest. In addition to being an authorized Panini Direct Dealer, the Sports Card Shop carries all major trading card brands, including Tops, Upper Deck, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, and more. With all that new wax, a half million singles, and showcases full of graded cards, you're sure to find something great for your collection, whether you're just starting out or a seasoned collector. The Sports Card Shop is your one-stop shop. So call us, come see us, or visit us on the web and social media. Our phone number is 269-469-0140. Website is thesportscardshopatmoco.com. The Sports Card Shop is part of the MoCo Retail Group, connecting sports, the hobby, and people around the world. Hey guys, it's Max from the Sports Card Shop. Today's exclusive Sports Card Nation listener special is 2021 Recon Basketball Hobby Boxes for only $199. Message the code SCNRecon to us on social at underscore the sports card shop to get the deal. Now, it's time to get back to John and Dan. Sports Card Nation, it's now time to chop it up with our featured guest on the one of one card shop guest line. Let's go! Happy to have my next guest on the Sports Card Nation guest line. He's a very experienced uh, author, writer, uh, newspaper, uh, news, uh, newsman, uh, has worked for the New York Post, 
the Daily News, ABC, NBC, double-digit years. I'm sure with, with his resume, I probably left something off. If so, I apologize uh, in advance. But without further ado, Mr. Dan Good, welcome to Sports Card Nation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So you 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 got a book coming out here coming up in in April of, of twenty uh, twenty two. Uh, it's not your first book. Uh, just going to be uh, your your latest one, and it's about a, a polarizing uh, athlete, baseball player who's uh, unfortunately uh, passed on, but uh, nineteen ninety six uh, MVP, uh, Mister Ken uh, Caminiti. I mean, he's definitely. Uh, a polarizing uh, athlete, as I, I said, but I guess the first question is for you. You know, why why Ken Caminiti? It's a really good question, and I've I've had that question asked to me so many times as I've wanted to talk to people about this project, and I think it really comes down to uh, just the guy he was, the player he was. You know, as a baseball fan in the 1990s, this guy was such a badass. Uh, you know, the diving stops at third base, the rocket for an arm, switch hit power, um, you know, the the Mexico series when he was battling, uh, you know, dehydration and uh, all these other issues and ends up getting IV fluid, you know, grabbing a Snickers bar and hitting two home runs. I mean, he was just a throwback. Um, the kind of the play, the kind of plays he made, the kind of player he was, he wasn't asking out of the lineup. He was always playing hurt. He was battling through so many injuries. I mean, the 96 season, he had a torn rotator cuff the first week of the season and ends up hitting 40 home runs and leading the Padres to the playoffs. I mean, just heroic stuff. And obviously you can look back now and say, yeah, he did this and he did that, but he would just, he was a fun player. And uh, as a fan of the nineties, you know, I think we missed out on some things because we didn't have that chance to watch streaming video we couldn't always see these players play so it was always sports center highlights baseball cards um appa uh board game for me with my with my family it was like these little avenues into these fans that weren't in your network in your regional area other than the all-star game in the world series in the playoffs um so it was really neat to kind of see him play whenever you could um and i just think he stood out to me um, he stood up to me for his honesty. He showed in 2002 when he came forward to Sports Illustrated to yeah. talk about steroids, you know, and then I think when he died in 2004, it just really struck me. You know, a lot of times people pass away, you're like, oh, it's too bad. But like, it kind of just lingered, you know, it was just like, why, why did this happen? And yeah. I always felt like as a journalist, I felt like there was a book there. I felt like somebody should tell the story and it got to the point where no one else had. And I said, you know, why not me? So I started researching and calling people and many, many years later, here we are. Yeah. By all accounts, uh, he, he was a very generous guy, uh, made a lot of trips to to children's hospitals, yeah. uh, did a lot of things for charity, you know, while battling his own, obviously personal demons, uh, as many of us found out, uh, more later than, than during as yet as you already uh, uh, alluded to, uh, was it hard to get, you know, uh, I've had authors on the show before and they talk about how difficult it is to get, you know, their book published and how many no's uh, they got before it finally, you know, could get it across the finish line uh, with it being Ken Kim and any, I know it's not your, your first book. So you, you have that a little bit of pedigree behind it. Was it, how difficult was it? being it was the, the, the subject was Ken Caminiti. That's a good question too. Um, you know, it, it's, it's layered because a lot of times with a book project and how I would a book, uh, approach a book project today would be to get a deal in place and then write the book. And mm -hmm. for this book, because I didn't have experience at the time as a book writer and I didn't have as much journalism experience, you know, we're talking a decade ago, um, because I didn't have as much experience or name recognition or anything, I said, I'm just going to see if I can get a book. I'm going to see if I can even write this. I'm going to see if I can get people to talk to me. Um, so I only actually came forward to start trying to sell this project in 2019. Um, so I was working on it for seven years without a deal in place. And mm -hmm. 
in that time, I became a book ghostwriter. So I started writing books for other people and writing proposals for other people and kind of learning how the system works, which really did help me. Um, but I got a lot of a lot of rejections when I did start pitching this project. I got a lot of people saying, you know, the market's thinned over recent years. The sports book market isn't the same as it used to be. Um, I got people telling me that um, this doesn't have the broad interest. I had other people telling me that because he's not li- alive anymore, that there's not a marketable uh, connection to it. You know, you can't have an autograph signing for Ken to go sign copies of the book. It's not mm-hmm. like a situation like that. So it, it, there's all these other elements at play, social media uh, reach, uh, the number of followers you have, you know, it's all based on guaranteed sales. And because it's tough to put that on paper and say, I can sell you X number of copies of the book, you know, it was tougher to get the deal in place. Uh, So it it did take, uh, I want to say three or four months of pitching agents, you know, and then I finally did find my agent, uh, Joe Perry, and he's been great. And then I was able to work with him and he pitched to different publishers, you know, and then we were able to find Abrams press and it worked out. But, you know, the interesting thing I go back to is over the years I've seen, and I remember I saw a tweet by Jeff Perlman about this. This would have been like in 2015 or 2016. And someone actually asked him about a book about Ken Kennedy. And I'm like, I'm writing that book. But um, I saw this tweet and someone asked him about a book about him. And he's like, I don't think there's a market for that, (laughs) which is so frustrating because you're like, what is why wouldn't there be a market? This, this guy's life was so interesting. And there's so many areas of fascination around his life, both good and bad, and um, just an interesting person. And, you know, it is a shame, I think, today, when you see um, books getting rejected, or, you know, the, the difficulty of getting a book published today is, is really tough. But I just think there's so many good stories to tell. There's so many books to write. um, And I don't, I don't think people should get discouraged by the nose because I know I didn't by, by the time that I was getting rejected from agents and publishers, I'd already interviewed 250, 300 people. Um, so I knew I had a good book. It was just a matter of yeah. somebody saying, yes, we want to publish this, but it's a difficult process. It's really, it's really, uh, it can be maddening, but um, it's special when it, when it comes together. Yeah, and you, like you said, you've got a lot of years uh, invested uh, in this book. Were you were you nervous with putting that much time and effort into it? Like, it, it, I mean, obviously it's it's coming out here in April, but before that was sort of done and and signed, sealed, and delivered, so to speak. Were you nervous? Like, hey, I'm putting a lot of work into this thing, and I I really don't know if it'll ever see the light of day. Potentially, it was I mean, wh- talk about like you know, the battle in your own mind with, you know, being so dedicated to getting it done, but just not knowing if, you know, it was going to be picked up, uh, so to speak. I think there has to be something deeper uh, within you that wants to do something like this. It can't just be, oh, I'm going to get paid because I have a deal. Yeah. I'm I'll, I'll do this book. I think for me, it was a matter of knowing I had to do it right. You can't just do a book like this and kind of like go halfway or like, weasel around it or like not really put the time in because the time is what matters. I mean, it's, it's getting the people to talk, it's finding the stories, it's digging deeper, digging beyond anything that you ever thought you could dig to, to find the story like this. And um, I, for me, I never looked at it like it wasn't worth the time because I knew the time would pay off just in the way it was, it was fruitful, but I just felt like there was more there was needed. And, and frankly, you could spend an entire lifetime on a book like this and never be completely done. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's never a point where like, I have every, every single thing I need, but you get to the point where you're like, okay, I have enough that I can publish and I feel good about this. But no, it, I mean, I hit a couple points where I kind of just had to put it aside for a little while. Uh, emotionally, it was overwhelming uh, at different points or you hit really tough uh, rejections or you get, um, you know, just difficulty or life gets in the way. Uh, you know, when, like my, my son is born and I'm like, this is it yeah. was because my son, it was great. My son was born. And like three weeks later was when the Padres were honoring Ken, um, with his hall of fame induction for the team. And I was like, I yeah. would love to go, but my son is three weeks old. Like I can't, I can't swing that. Um, 
which was, yeah. you know, the timing wasn't ideal for that uh, event, but, you know, it seemed that it was, you know, a great time for, for everybody there. But, um, you know, I just, you know, it's just the reality of it. And, you know, you just kind of stick with it and see where it goes. But yeah, I mean, it's, there's ups and downs and, you know, there's times when life gets too busy where you can't devote the energy you want to it. And, and that's frustrating, but it's always kind of there. And for me, it was always kind of like, I need to go back to it. I need to keep working at it. And, you know, I'm just proud of how it came together. Yeah. When you, when we think about Ken Caminiti, the subject of this book, I mean, people forget, like everyone thinks about the home runs, the 96 MVP season, obviously some of the bad things obviously are going to come uh, to light, uh, but he was one heck of a, a defensive player as well. One, uh, won multiple gold gloves. People forget about that. Uh, when it comes to the steroid era, he was, to to my knowledge, and you can correct me, he was really one of the first ones to sort of raise his hand and said, "Hey, I'm not proud of it. Uh, I did it," uh, and really was very truthful. He didn't, you know, you hear guys say, oh, "I tried it once," or you know, and I, I think they're not, they, they tell the truth, but I don't think they're telling the whole truth. Mm-hmm. Um, and he came out and said, Hey, I used it in my MVP season. I used it years uh, after that. And uh, really kind of was the first one. Uh, and I think there's something to that. I think, uh, you know, you, when you think of Rafael Pomero in Congress and pointing his finger back at Congress saying, Mm-hmm. I didn't do this, and it really came out later that that wasn't the case for a guy to not really under that kind of scrutiny to, to come clean on that in, in front of Congress just to say, hey, look, this this happened. Uh, I did it. Uh, I'm not really proud of it. Uh, I got some things going on. You know, I think there's something to be said about someone who kind of, you know, yeah, he did it, but to to be honest about it. Uh, and, and and sort of be put himself out there knowing that he was going to take some shots. You know, there's going to be people that say, you know, take that MVP uh, trophy award uh, away. Uh, mm-hmm. It didn't, thankfully, it didn't happen. You know, I don't think it should. You know, it's something to be said about that. Yeah, I think that was a really important part of his disclosure in 2002 because it came at the same time that, Jose Canseco was starting to come forward and talk about this book that he was writing that came out in 2005. That was explosive in its own right. Um, But he had an axe to grind. Jose Canseco did. Ken didn't. Ken wasn't trying to burn bridges. He didn't name names. He didn't throw any of his teammates under the bus. Um, He was simply trying to share his own truth. And, you know, he was uh, coming out of rehab uh, for addiction issues at that point in time, you know, and trying to keep his life clean and trying to, um, to be open and honest. And uh, for him to admit to that as clearly and as vocally as he did, I think meant so much to the game. He, you know, his fellow players, some of them came out and were really critical you know, he's a rat, he's a snitch, all these other things. But when you look back, and you're exactly right, I mean, some of the other players who've been forced to come forward and admit to use have all said, it didn't help me, it didn't do this, it didn't do that, I only used it for a little while. Most of the time, that's not true. I mean, yes, some of them. Um, it, and it really, there's a range of reasons for players who use steroids in that era. A lot of them were trying to hang on. I think in Ken's case, it was a, a way of him keeping up his level of play. You know, after in 1995, 1996, he's 32, 33, he's on the wrong side of 30. His body isn't responding the way it used to. Um, You know, he really wants to maintain his level of play. And that's when he started turning to them. You know, and this had been something that he had considered doing earlier in his career. You know, he was uh, offered steroids or researched steroids in the early 90s and didn't use them at the time because he was still performing at a high level. You know, when you start to decline a little bit, that's when you start to wonder, you know, how can it help me to hang on? You know, so I look at some of these guys who are using it for uh, rehab purposes to get back from an injury. They're the 25th guy in the roster and they're trying to stay on the team to make that uh, that paycheck, to make that salary, to provide for their family. You know, obviously the Barry Bonds is and Roger Clemens is and Alex Rodriguez get a lot of the attention, but it's all those other guys, the middle relievers, the, the last guys on the yeah. roster. Like 
you know, people can argue that they're cheating the game, but there, there were no, there were no testing policies in place at the time. There was a piece of paper saying these are, these are banned, but no one was doing anything about it. Uh, But for him to come forward and to admit to it the way he did blew the lid open on uh, baseball's innocence. It blew the lid open on the entire performance enhancing era. Uh, the McGuire Sosa, the Barry Bonds the Roger Clemens is, I think it forced us as fans to finally be critical of what we were seeing and say, is this actually real? Did this happen? Uh, the way we think it is, is this innocent? You know, you go back and look at the glowing magazine profiles and TV pieces about the McGuire's and the Sosa's from 98 and it's so like laughable now, you know, to yeah. say, <laughs> you know, well, you know, the um the bottle was found in Mark McGuire's locker. And, you know, it was the reporter who was blasted, not McGuire himself, yeah. you know, who was using yeah. performance enhancing drugs at the time that were not allowed in the Olympics. I'm gonna step aside for a quick break, but we'll be right back with more with Dan Good. Pastime Marketplace has a line of graded card cases that are waterproof, airtight, dust tight, and hardened to protect and organize your valuable collection. Each of our cases come with pre-cut and pre-formed foam so you don't have to cut and tear the foam when you get your case. The pre-cut foam inserts are sized to hold PSA, Beckett, SGC, and CGS slabs. Store it all safely and securely with a case from Pastime Marketplace. Check them out at www.pastimemarketplace.com. Sports Card Nation is back with more with Dan Good. The other thing about that era, too, is that was the time when different supplements started to come to use, you know, creatine and other ones. So it, yeah. there was such a blurry line where people were using creatine, people were using steroids, um, but a lot of them, they knew what they were doing. I'm not saying that they were fully aware of things. And I don't think Ken was as aware of things as he needed to be at times, but uh, you know, they knew what they were doing. They knew that these things helped them. You look at the power numbers that they were putting up and you say, where did this come from? This guy never hit this many home runs before at any level of professional baseball. And now he's hitting 40 and 50. Like, yeah, that's suspect. Um, but yeah. You know, I, I think that Ken's disclosure in 2002 was massive and, um, you know, he paid a big price for it. There was a lot of people who blasted them for it. But ultimately, you know, all these years later, I think we can look back in appreciation for what he did because there have been very few players who have come forward honestly in the way that he has. And, um, you know, I think that it really stands out. Yeah, I agree. And the ones that have, Dan, really only did, do uh, almost when they're backed in the corner – and mm-hmm. they have no other choice. They're almost, it's like they're really caught. And then they try to, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say belittle it, but they try to justify why they did it and why they didn't say nothing uh, yeah. for so long. You know, uh, Ken didn't do that. He kind of came clean. Sure. The, some others didn't like it uh, because they wanted it to be, you know, baseball's dark secret for, for longer uh, than it wound up uh, being. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't condone the usage, but sure. I did respect the fact that without a, a lot of pressure, he just kind of said, hey, this I did this. Uh, it's not good. And here's a little bit why. And, you know, he you know what, what a lot of players did, like I said, was they I think they also even when they admitted to it, I think they lied about how long they did oh, yeah. it for. And oh, yeah. I, I didn't get the impression with him. And, and you know, the sad part was, like, he, he battled some drug addiction. And I, I believe had he beaten that, uh, ultimately, I think he would have, you know, done a lot of great things off the field post-career in helping other people uh, battle their own uh, addictions and demons. And it's just sad, uh, unfortunately, that wasn't uh, uh, to be. Uh, you know, passing away in, in 2004. But had that not happened, he got clean and sober. I think he would have been there from from all everything I've heard about him. You know, even even being a user and some of these other demons, you know, a lot of stories you hear about about how generous and giving and unselfish he was. And so, uh, I think had he gotten past that, uh, he would have been an advocate to help others uh, try to get past. Uh, some of those issues uh, themselves. It's just, you know, it's a shame, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't get that opportunity. 
uh, self-inflicted, but it's still it's still sad, just the the same. And uh, you know, uh, you said you spoke to you know over two hundred fifty uh, people, you know, associated or affiliated uh, with Ken Caminiti in, in the writing of the book. Were, were most people willing to kind of share their stories uh, uh, about yeah. him? It ended up being about 400 people I spoke to. Wow. Um, yeah, it. Um, most people did talk to me. I mean, there were some people close to him that didn't want to talk, and I certainly respected that. But, um, you know, got to talk to Bruce Bochy. I cold called him, and he called me back. Uh, I, I cold called Bobby Cox and talked to him uh, four or five years ago. Um, Greg Vaughn, Luis Gonzalez, um, you know, a lot, a lot of players from the 90s. Um, it's just neat because, you know, even players like Walt Weiss is a good example. Uh, Walt Weiss was on the Braves in 99 and they played against the Astros in the playoffs. And there was a play that Walt Weiss made that saved this, this game for the, the Braves. He was diving, bases loaded. Tony Eusebio was batting for the Astros and Walt Weiss dove. And he had to dive almost backwards, like toward the outfield to get this ball. And he threw home. And he got Ken out at home and the Braves ended up winning that game. They won the series. And after the game, um, Ken called Walt Weiss was in the clubhouse and he gets a phone call and it's from Ken. And Ken's like, I'm so mad that you beat us, but that was like the best freaking play I've ever seen. I just want you to know that it's those little types of things that stand out to me the most, um, you know, from the fellow players that I talked to of Ken's, um, you know, Billy Wagner was, uh, you know, he kind of took Billy Wagner under his wing when he was with the Astros. Um, you know, and going back even to the earlier years with like Billy Doran, Kevin Bass, and those those Astros teams of the 80s. It just, it's been really interesting to to learn about his playing days. It's been interesting to learn about his past, you know, calling his high school friends, his college friends, you know, and just kind of learning how he became who he became and um, the warm, generous person he is. You you alluded to it, but I mean, there was a situation in 1997 with the Padres and they had uh, a really close fan of theirs, uh, Cindy Mathers, who had passed away of cancer. And the Padres wanted to do something to raise money for um, in her name. And uh, one of the uh, community representatives for the Padres was going around talking to the players and seeing what they wanted to do. And she approached Ken and it was close to game time. And he had that stoic, like, you know, didn't say much. She was really like, he looked disgruntled. He looked angry. And she was like explaining to him what she wanted to do. Uh, and if there was anything that he could think of that he was, you know, going to do to help this thing. And he didn't say much. And she was like, he's probably just mad. He doesn't want to be bothered. And she was around the next day. And he actually came up to her and was like, I'd like to donate my motorcycle uh, to help wow. for this fundraiser. And it was interesting because she thought he was mad at the time, but he was actually just thinking about it. You know, sometimes he's yeah. had to think about things. And there's so many little instances like that of him going out of his way to help people, of making his teammates feel welcome. There were so many guys that he took under his wing, uh, even going back to Phil Nevin. So Phil Nevin was the number one pick in the 92 draft. The Astros could have picked that Derek Jeter guy from the shortstop from Michigan. <laughs> they didn't pick him. They picked Phil Nevin instead, who had a really nice career and is, you know, a yeah. really good coach. But, um, you know, they uh, – and Phil Nevin's a third baseman. So they have Ken Caminiti at third base. Now you have Phil Nevin, who's going to be the guy down the road. And most players in Ken's shoes would have said, screw this guy. I'm not helping yeah. him. Ken instead says, I'm going to invite him to my house in the offseason – and work out with him for a couple of weeks and show him the ropes on what it means to be a major league player. Basically saying, if you're going to take my job, you're going to do it the right way. And the same thing he did with Jeff Bagwell in 1991, when the Astros traded um, for the Red Sox, uh, Larry Anderson to the Red Sox for Jeff Bagwell and Jeff Bagwell's a third baseman. Here's a guy who's in line to take Ken's job. And uh, the same thing, like Ken, you know, uh, put up a great competition, obviously, and Jeff Bagwell had a good spring. And the other third baseman they they camp at the, that year, Luis Gonzalez, had a good spring. And Art Howe decided, hey, I'm going to move Jeff Bagwell to first base, and I'm going to move Luis Gonzalez to left field, and I'm going to keep Ken at third. Um, but he was just – he was an awesome teammate like that. You know, he was always going out of his way to help people. And, um, you know, I think those those good things shine through. You know, his, his good heart shines through even though – 
you know, he was battling some things internally. There were so many good things that he was doing. And, and, you know, I think those positive things really, uh, you know, outweigh everything else that was going on with his life. Yeah, no, no doubt. Now, did you, did you yourself uh, have any kind of um, interactions with him while he was, during his playing days? No, I wish I had. I, I was really disappointed. I was kind of going back into this and thinking about it, but I haven't. Um, I Every time I went to see his, his teams play, he wasn't playing or he was hurt. Um, so I'd seen the Astros play around the time he was on the team. I got Jeff Bagwell's autograph. Uh, I met Greg Vaughn. I got his autograph. I saw the Padres play the year after he left in 99. Because uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so it was kind of like the Phillies or the Orioles that I would go and see. And yeah. uh, I never saw him play live, um, which is disappointing. But I saw a lot of players who he interacted with and always appreciated those guys. And um, and that's been kind of neat, too, kind of going down these childhood paths and be like, oh, I, you know, I got Greg Vaughn's autograph at a game, a Reds game in 1999. Here I am talking to him on the phone, um, yeah. you know, but it, it just, it, it's, I always wish I would have been able to interact with him. And, um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that you think about, but, um, and even the, the Rangers in 2001, uh, he had been released by the time uh, I got to see them. They're my favorite team. Um, yeah. So, uh, sadly, but um, he wasn't on the team when they uh, when they played in uh, Baltimore. But uh, just I just missed him like a couple different times. Yeah, but you're probably in, in writing to this book and and talking into talking to that many people who who know him. You almost probably uh, at this point almost feel like you've gotten to know him through the writing of the book and talking to other people. Uh, who knew knew him so well. Oh yeah. Yeah. You kind of, you walk around in their shoes and you kind of see how they see the world and see how they react to things. And even just the quotes he gave, you know, after different performances, you know, after the world series game one in 1998, he was in the, the clubhouse after the game and got interviewed and he was just like, so deflated Padres had lost. And you could just see it on his face. So you're like, or other times in 96, you can see when he's getting animated in interviews uh, when he's really engaged, or like his hands are moving a certain way, uh, there's just little things that you, you 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 walk around with somebody's story and ideas in mind for so long, and you start like picking up little pieces, uh, little clues, and it's interesting to to bring that all together and you know and look at the world through their eyes, you know, and and understand and appreciate things that you didn't before. Sure, it's going to be a great read. That's April. It's coming up here on uh, April of 2022, and. Uh, uh, you know, one thing I want to stress, you know, I'm not a fan of, of the players using uh, steroids. Uh, I, I think it's wrong. But, you know, these guys are humans. Uh, there's more to them than just the player on the field as well. I think without seeing this book or reading it yet, obviously, I think that's going to come out, uh, it sounds like. And uh, I think that's important uh, as well. These are these are human beings uh, besides uh, incredible athletes and uh uh, I think that story uh, needs to be told, and I'm I'm glad uh, you're doing that, uh, Dan, and look forward to uh, to reading it uh, in April, probably along with many others as well. Thank you so much. Going to step aside for another real quick break, but we'll be right back after that. Greg Morris Cards wants to buy your cards. A long trusted name in the sports card business, Greg has been buying sports card collections for over a decade now. Any sport, baseball, basketball, football, or hockey, in any era, vintage or modern, will do. Just no junk wax error sets, please. To learn more and to sell Greg Morris your cards, go to www.gregmorriscards.com. Fill out the consignment sale request form and someone will get back to you on how to get cash for your cards. Also, if you're a dealer looking to sell your collection, Greg Morris wants to talk. Plenty of dealers use Greg Moore's massive eBay platform as a way to consign their cards. Take advantage of Greg's experience in the hobby to get more bang for your buck. We are back with more with Dan. Kind of speak to your collecting uh, interest uh, as a card collector. And, and, and just kind of the segue from writing this book, did you become like, did you kind of seek out any Cam and Nitty cards? I mean, to be honest with you, they're not crazy expensive. That's one. 
This one yep. is. So this is the 1985 Osceola Astros team issue. Wow. Uh, they gave this away to fans. There weren't that many fans that showed up. And this this card is hard to find. I was on eBay for years, every single day, probably for five or six years until one popped up. And it happened to be the highest graded one. Uh, it's a 9.5 Beckett grade, and the signature is a 9. These yeah. things, I, I, there might be a hundred or two hundred that exist. Yeah. I mean, they, they were given away at they, you know, they were at the stadium, and this was in you know '85, and um, you know, the players have these cards, and a couple fans do, but the fans weren't showing up. So uh, yeah. I was really happy to to get one. But no, I mean, it's neat to see the cards. It's neat to appreciate those cards. I mean, I became a collector in the '90s. Um, I really became a collector in starting in '93. Uh, I was given a pack of 93 Upper Deck, and it was a jumbo pack. And I opened it up, yep. and there was uh, Upper Deck then and now Nolan Ryan in there. And yep. it was right around the same time I'd read a newspaper article about Nolan. It was his last season. It was, like, really exciting. And I was like, this guy's awesome. Um, so I, you know, started collecting cards from there. And, you know, it's been really interesting kind of, you know, being in the hobby through the 90s, early 2000s kind of leaving a little bit, you know, go to college, start your career. You don't have any money, so you can't buy cards. And then yeah. you kind of get back into it and you're like, wow, this has changed. This is a little bit different yeah. than what I'm used to. <laughs> and now it's expensive and so you don't have any money, but you have some cards. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm half kidding. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy where, how things can, can change. I'm assuming uh, with that pulling that Ryan out of that 93 upper deck uh, jumbo pack, that's where the, the Ranger fandom kind of started. Yeah. That's where it started. It was, it was that. And then it was no, it was Juan Gonzalez in the home run derby. He won that year. And it was yeah. like that, that, those two things. And then they had the new stadium and the new uh, uniforms and logo. And I was like, I was so hooked. Kenny Rogers, perfect game, like yeah. such a good team. And like, and that really just struck it for me. And it was just, you know, I kind of just wanted to find my own team because my dad was a Phillies fan. My mom was a Reds fan from the big red machine. And yeah, you know, I like the Reds, but like I wanted to find my own team and here's the Rangers and no one's a Rangers fan that I know. So it was kind of, kind of neat to embrace yeah. that and, uh, you know, appreciate that and collect as many Rangers cards as I could. Yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a New York City kid from Brooklyn. Uh, I, I was a Yankee fan when I was very young, and then Steinbrenner sort of ruined it for me with, like, sure. trading guys left and right, signing guys left and right. So I became a Mets fan uh, when they were losing 110 games a year, so no one could say I jumped on, like, a, a winning <laughs> bandwagon. And then for football, you know, for football for me, I've told the story on the show before, um, I was a Steeler fan. I took a lot of heat from my friends growing up in New York. Like, how are you a Steelers fan? You're in New York City. We got the Jets. We got the Giants. I said, I just don't like the Jets and Giants. And I just love the, the color uniform. I was a big mean Joe Green uh, guy. And if you remember the Coke commercial came out in oh, yeah. uh, 1977, 78, where, the, you know, for those that don't remember, you know, a kid, uh, has a Coke, a, a kid that was actually my age at the same time uh, and gives Mean Joe the Coke and Mean Joe has his jersey draped over his shoulder and says, hey, kid, throws the, the jersey to the kid. And just be number one commercial of all time when they do they do those shows for, for marketing and number one commercial. And I saw I had a resemblance besides being the same age as that kid, I look like that kid. And so I sort of vicariously became that kid. And it was a big, you know, seeing that big mean Joe green and actually do something nice. I became a, a mean Joe and a, a Steeler fan. Uh, yes, they were winning then. So I can't, I can't say the same thing with my Mets fandom. I did kind of <laughs> jump on, but it really wasn't so much the Super Bowls as it was that commercial and mean Joe. Sure. And, uh, you know, I took a lot of heat at, at first uh, from friends, but uh, I stuck with them from the age of six or seven. I'm, I'm 48 now. Uh, wow. We usually get to Pittsburgh once or twice a year uh, under normal circumstances uh, uh, for for some Steeler games. And, uh, you know, it's that's funny. I love asking you, uh, uh, those who come on, sort of where the fandom starts. For, for you, it was that Ryan coming out of that pack. 
And for me, it's the Coke commercial with Mean Joe and the Steelers. It's those stories that are just sometimes so interesting. When you even think about it, had that been maybe a different card, you might be a fan of a different team, you know. So had had Coke decided to, you know, hire a different athlete, maybe I might not be a Steeler fan. I might be who knows what what team at at that point. So uh, I just love those stories, like how did you become a fan, especially if it's a team that's like in a different state or or not necessarily close, you know. I mean, a lot of times, obviously, uh, you make a great point. A lot of times we're sort of – indoctrinated and you know whatever our parents are fans of we sort of get uh you know we have to be you're automatically a fan of that team or if you live in that city uh, and that's the home team you sort of uh, by location and so especially when it's a team that maybe you, you know like you said you're from pennsylvania but yet you're a ranger fan it's always interesting to hear how that all comes into play and uh, uh there you go and it's just a pull of a card really in your case and uh, of a hall of famer, no doubt, but uh, yeah. still the, the fact that that's what uh, started it all. So today, where do your collecting interests lie? What, what kind of stuff do you, do you like to collect and, and, and acquire? It's still Ranger stuff. Um, and it, it goes all over the place. I love like just the variety of it all. Um, I really got into Dixie lids uh, over the past couple of years from like the, the fifties. Um, yeah. they had them through like the thirties to the fifties, but like 52 to 54 had baseball players on them. And there's hundreds of different v- variations of the ice cream companies on the back. It's like little things like that. Um, a big Bobby Shantz fan. Um, there's just so many like different things I get into, but, um, I would say still Rangers, mostly, um, 1990s stuff, um, which, The frustrating thing, interesting and frustrating is that, you know, over the past decade, I've been consistently buying up like junk wax from the 90s and just opening it because I like, you know, and you might get like a box of like 96 finest for like 50 bucks or 75 bucks. And now this stuff is (laughs) exorbitantly priced. It's all gone up. And I'm like, this is my stuff. (laughs) This is the stuff I always buy. I can't find it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's funny because uh, I grew up in that era, too. I was born in 72. My first pack was 79 tops. And uh, even to find, like you said, that 90s stuff, now everyone's trying to go back and, and reacquire it. And it's, it's the de- you know, I think the demand is sort of overmatching uh, the supply. And we all know uh, you don't have to be an economics major to figure out uh, when that happens, the prices obviously going to go up. I mean, it's not crazy, but it's not as cheap as we uh, once remember it. And, uh, but like you said, it's still fun. That sort of uh, nostalgia, go back and, and open that stuff up and sort of, you know, the smell. I mean, I even talk uh-huh. about the smells of the car that it sounds weird, but it's true. Uh-huh. That bring you back to your, your childhood and uh, a day, you know, of innocence. I always joke, you know, uh, during those times, you know, no bills, nothing, nothing too crazy uh, to worry about. And uh, uh, it's nice to go back there. And uh, you can't go back for real. You know, I always joke uh, that the DeLorean and Back to the Future is just a movie. It'd be nice if it really was true. But, uh, you know, uh, so the closest thing you can get is opening the packs from that era uh, the smells and it just reminisce and, and take you back. Even if it's for just a few moments, uh, it's worth it. And uh, I do it too. And it's, it's fun. And uh, you know, what some of my favorite, uh, I was 17 at the time, but opening up some of the packs from 89 with the Griffey oh. rookies. Oh, uh, yeah. And I think that's where it began uh, for a lot of, a lot of people, the Griffey rookie chase, especially on the upper deck side of things. And uh you know, but uh, it's those things that we'll, we'll always can go back to how we first got into cards or certain years we remember and why. And I'm going to step aside, take a real quick break to hear from one of our great sponsors, but we'll be right back after that. Hey, everybody. Have you heard about Collectible? It's the one-stop shop where any collector can buy and trade affordable shares in some of the most rare and valuable sports cards and memorabilia in the world, starting from just $5. 
From 1952 Mickey Mantle PSA 10s in Wilt Chamberlain's iconic rookie uniform to one-of-one Patrick Mahomes RPAs, rare LeBron James logo mans, and everything in between, Collectible is creating never-before-seen access and opportunities for all. Let's grow the hobby we love together. Please note this is not a recommendation or solicitation to buy any security. All investment decisions should be undertaken after doing your own research. Welcome back. Here's more with Dan Good. 85 Donruss uh, was a, a big set for me. Just I loved mm. the design. Uh, Manly Winfield had a, a lot of cards. That was the the batting race uh, the, the year before. You know, that was the batting race year. Yeah. Uh, I was in New York still. And so uh, at that point, I, I was I was more of a Mets fan, but I was Manly was still one of my favorite players. Uh, I just, you know, Steinbrenner had kind of ruined it. Uh, for me at that point, but I still respected Donnie baseball the way he played. And, uh, sure. you know, so it's, it, you just think about certain years and designs of cards and, and, and opening more, let's say for, for, for those reasons uh, and whatnot. So do you open a lot of current stuff? I know we talked about some of the, you know, the, the, the older junk wax, as you say, do you get to open much of the, the current stuff? Yeah, I mean, I would say so. Um, probably every month or so. Um, yeah. Obviously, my wife Suze is like really into uh, current cards, and yeah, it's interesting being able to collect and appreciate it through her eyes, and like understanding how the sets are put together and the composition of it all. I mean, we were just opening uh, Tops Update uh, the other day. You know, I'm I'm trying to stay up on it as much as possible, and it's. I mean, it's. Obviously, there's supply chain issues going on this year that make things difficult, and there's other complexities and difficulties, yeah. and you know, um, uh, big deals going on that are <laughs> very <laughs> difficult to keep track. But uh, no, it's. I mean, it's still at the end of the day, it's still you're opening cards. You know, you never know what you're going to find inside. It's that rush, the excitement, the yeah. unknown. You know, maybe this guy will be the next big thing. That's been interesting, too, going back and looking at all these cards that we've opened over the past decade or so and finding so many cards that you didn't know you had, finding guys who became good, even like uh, Cedric Mullins. You know, he has a breakout season. Like, oh, I have a, you know, Bowman chrome of him. Like, you know, it's just neat to be able to go back and say, like, oh, I actually have cards of these guys. Because when you're pulling them from packs as rookies or as prospects, a lot of times you don't know who they are. You don't know who they're going to become. Uh, So it's really neat to be able to say, I have this when you didn't even know you had it. But um, no, I mean, yeah, I'm still, I still, you know, stay up on current stuff and uh, open current stuff pretty regularly. Uh, Is there any any current products that you really like? Uh, I try to open a little bit of everything. You you made a point earlier, you know, with, with some of the prices, it's, it's hard to open. I open a lot less now, believe it or not, than, than I used to. I just sort of learned, uh, you know, trial and error that, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, you usually come out on the loop. It's fun. It's fun as heck in the process. And then sort of when the smoke clears and the dust settles, you realize like, wow, I didn't really get, I didn't get my values uh, worth. It's funny. You mentioned, uh, Dan, it's funny you mentioned Cedric Mullins. It's a funny story here, or at least to me. Uh, I'm going to maybe find it funny than, than some other. W- whenever I've had open stuff in the last few years, I'm like a Cedric Mullins magnet. I was just e- pulling <laughs> Cedric Mullins stuff. And at the time, he kind of struggled. He had he a looks, year yeah. he had him like 163. And so when I was getting him, I mean, with all due respect to Cedric Mullins, I'm like, oh, man, Cedric Mullins. <laughs> And now it's funny when I heard you say, yeah, you know, you pull this out, like, yeah, like we're 30, 30 season. And, uh, you know, like now I'm pulling all those Mullins. I just have kind of, I keep, I'm really organized. So like all my Mullins is, I didn't have to like look in a million different boxes. to pull. They were all together, but the pulling them out, I'm like, these turned out to be not terrible uh, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. And that's the, that's the one fun thing about baseball is, you know, uh, from one year to the next, the guy can can you know jumpstart his career. Uh, it's also fun to buy somebody uh, like that. You know, you look at a guy like uh, Luis Robert this uh, last mm-hmm. year got hurt. A lot of you know, it amazes me when a guy gets hurt 
how many people like jump ship like they're never going to come back and yeah. play baseball again. If it's not a career and an injury, it's something they can come back and play. And uh, you know, they he's a guy I think is going to be a, a, a very good player. And so yeah. I bought some when people were kind of dumping them and and getting rid of them cheap. I said, hey. The guy's injured, but he's going to play again. And if someone's <laughs> going to give up uh, at the drop of a dime like that, uh, I'll take a flyer in, that, in those kind of situations. And he came back this year and played actually pretty well. So we'll yeah. see. You know, again, he could. You know, anything can happen on any given know. day. God forbid. So you're right. You you, you never know. You mentioned, uh, you know, you're you're married to Sue, so yeah. You, you know, everyone in, in the hobby is very familiar, and she's. She's a, a hobby icon and, uh, you know, done a lot of great things for the hobby. You, even if you didn't like cards, you, you'd, have, you, you'd be indoctrinated, you know, talk about indoctrinated, you, you'd be, uh, to, you know. Uh, how is that? Do you have, like, debates in, in, at home about players or sets or, or, or hobby? I, yeah, it's a, re- it's a really good question. I think we both have different interests in it. Um, you know, and it's it's been interesting to see those things offset. You know, when I came in, we started dating. Like, I was still into the common cards and 90s stuff. And, like, going yeah. back and opening, you know, 92 score and finding cool things in there. Um, you know, and, and she was more into the current stuff, the modern stuff, and the big hits. You know, yeah. and, and I was never into big hits uh, in collecting. And then when you open a lot of boxes of modern stuff, you get excited about the big hits and you're like, wow, this is great. Um, so it's been interesting to kind of like pair those two interests and recognize and appreciate, you know, the the things that she's collecting and she respects and appreciates the things that I'm collecting. And like, I look out for Yankees players for her and she looks out for Rangers players for me. And um, there's so much, um, there's so much to collect. There's so much out there. And it's interesting to, the other thing too for her is like during her time at tops, like being able to understand, like kind of behind the curtain, like what's actually happening. How yeah. how's this put together? Um, one of the coolest things was when because she was the editor on 2017 Stadium Club, and you know she was do, picking all the pictures, and she's like, "Do you want to help me pick some pictures?" So like, there you go. I picked pictures for like <laughs> 2017 Stadium Club, which was awesome and i'm like oh i picked this picture like the lou garrett yeah. is like i picked that picture you know and i found That's out cool. later that there was a there was a set that came out in like 2002 or 2001 that used the same picture like it's one of those things that like i, I may have even seen the original and not even realized it and like not yes. connected to the nuts. um you know it wasn't some of these repeats you see like one year to the next and you're like oh that's kind of that's kind of weak, but, uh, <laughs> but in any event, it just, it's really neat to collect through other people's eyes and to like appreciate different things. And like, she'll get into different players and like, Oh, it's like, Oh, Anthony Rizzo's on the Yankees. So I want to get something of him or, you know, um, yeah. some of the big prospects coming up from the Yankees. So it's, it's really neat to kind of see the hobby through different levels and then like see her Jeter collection. Like she's yeah. like, yeah. super into Jeter. I'm like, <laughs> Jeter, obviously I have a lot of Jeter cards just from collecting, but like he was never a guy I looked out for. Um, yeah. And there's so many like variations. There's so many uh, minor league products he was in. There's so many, you yeah. know, uh, hard to find rare items from like the early part of his career that you're never going to find because no one sells them. Um, but there's just, it's really neat to to look at the the hobby through different different eyes and different levels and, and appreciate it uh, anew. So I don't want to misquote you here. So what you're saying is you were the, the, the magic behind some of these tops releases. <laughs> and not Sue. <laughs> I would say that I helped. She's the one who signed off on the final, um, final things, but I, yeah. I helped pick a couple of the pictures. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's very cool. And I, how many people get to say they, they had a little bit of a small part and something like that so uh, very very cool real quick break to pay another bill but we'll be right back with more with dan good iron sports cards is your number one source for all your psa and other grading submissions their elite status improves turnaround times heck they even provide the card savers their chat rooms provide updates on all your submissions they also offer wax options and single cards to cover all the bases Check them out on Facebook at Iron Sports Cards Group or on the web at ironsportscards.com. 
or even give them a call at 1-877-I-R-O-N-P-S-A. Rob's got you covered. Fourth Car Nation is back with more with Dan Good. Tops for me for being a Brooklyn kid. Uh, Tops was born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn a, a few years later, let's just say. But f- from a very early age, like, it was Tops. And uh, 70 years of, of history, uh, you alluded to some of the recent news with, with Fanatics uh, getting awarded uh, the license here uh, in a few years. When that news uh, came across my phone, Dan, uh, the Brooklyn kid in me, that my heart uh, sank a little bit. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying... I'm not saying Tops isn't a little bit culpable in the loss of the license, but when someone's done something for 70 years and there's a chance that that's the end, I don't care who you are, uh, but even more so, I think uh, being in the hobby, doing content creation, being from Brooklyn, it really, really struck a chord, a sad chord to me that we might not see those five letters on a baseball card. Uh, at least for a while. Uh, yeah. The word is it's a 20-year deal that Fanatics now has. Um, you know, we don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. We're a couple years away from anything of, of substance being produced. You know, Tops could sell to Fanatics potentially. There could be some sort of deal to use Tops branding and, and keep some of these brands or lines alive under the Fanatics rule, if you will. So we don't know. Uh, officially how this was all going to shake out. But, you know, assuming that Fanatic says, hey, it's our license. We don't need your tops. We're going to do our own thing. Thank you. know, thanks for 70 years. But we'll take it from here. If that's the way it goes, you know, someone like myself and I think many others, it's going to be a sort of a sad day. Uh, I hope uh, tops lives on in some form or fashion. I, I, I hope Cooler heads prevail, and, and even Fanatics realizes the importance of 70 years. I know they won the license, and, and they want to, you know, to the victor goes the spoils, uh, as they say. But I just hope there's some sort of olive branch to collectors where Tops has that meaning to them. Um, sort of your thoughts as someone who has, you know, that uh, a little bit of that inside uh, look and, and knows uh, about Tops from – from the way you do and, and being married to, to Sue's and, and, and even besides that, just being in the cards and collecting, you know, what, what, when you heard that news, like what were some of your early thoughts uh, at the time? I, I, it's the same as you in a way, it was just shock. You're like, how yeah. is this possible? You know, you, you try to run it through your head and it just doesn't register. You're like tops is baseball cards. This is how yeah. it's been since 1951. 1952 was the first flagship set. Like this is massive seismic shifts in the hobby. And, and, you know, it changes the entire game. It changes every single thing that we know about collecting and collecting cards in the way that we do. Um, I will say this though. Um, You know, I think that it's disappointing to see the direction that everything's taken in general. And I don't even say that about just the tops license. I say that about everything else. You look back in the, 90s and early 2000s, there was so much innovation in the hobby. There were so many different companies involved. And obviously, some of them did not work and did not last. Um, yeah. But, you know, there was so much innovation, so many ideas and so many fresh new things. You know, Chrome, Finest, Game Use stuff, parallel uh, cards, um, you know, autographs and packs. I mean, all these things happened over the course of about a decade. Um, you know, and then you look at everything is kind of chasing that, chasing after that, um, you know, and there's new things that come out, but, you know, they're kind of like derivative and building off of stuff that we've already seen before. Um, but going back to that, you know, the deal in place and what, what Fanatics does next, you know, I think you look at some of the other situations like this that have emerged, uh, like Panini, for example, you know, Panini had to acquire brands and property to be able to, to make products. I don't see how fanatics, and this is just my own speculation. This is not based on yeah. anything. I don't, I don't see how fanatics could create cards, create card sets, create card products and not buy some company that already exists 
and the brands that they have. Because otherwise, yeah. every single thing you create is going to be somehow connected to something that's already been made before. So there's a lawsuit. There's a lawsuit. There's a lawsuit. Um, yeah. You know, how can you create a Chromium product if you're not Chrome or Prism? You know, it's really tough to find a narrow yeah. area where this is unique and new and different. Uh, when these other companies have been doing it before and these brands are very popular, um, you know, and, and you look at the deal and it's like you look at something like Prism that's really finding its footing and like popular and like coming into its own. You're like, oh, this is frustrating. Like I was really interested to see what comes out next. Um, yeah. but, but going back to this, like I really do think I would love to see Tops connected to this if Fanatics ends up buying the Tops license and can create tops products under its umbrella that would be great yeah. if they you know want to work with panini like they're gonna to have to work with somebody they can't just create a card company out of thin air and have no licenses and no brands and create a range of products that people are going to love i mean that would take years and years and years and i don't know how it would work um but if you buy a tops or you buy the properties and are able to put out brands that Topps has made and that people already love, that would, I think, go a long way to bridging the gap for collectors like ourselves who have been in this hobby for a long time. I think it would be very tough for fanatics to win us over if they don't have something that we already hold near and dear to us and they're just creating something completely new. Um, you know, but I, I think the model, you know, it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary looking at, um, you know, the potential changes that could happen. Uh, it's kind of scary at the, the model being disrupted. Uh, I don't like that much change. I'm not a big mm -hmm. person. I'm not a big proponent for change that way. Uh, but obviously the world's changing and um, I'm hopeful that um, whatever form this takes in the future will incorporate the best parts of the hobby now, even if it's a little bit different than what we're used to. But I would love if um, some of these, you know, iconic brands like Tops um, would be involved in this process and not on the outside looking in and not completely boxed out and pushed away from the hobby. Because as you said, like Tops and the hobby are, you know, synonymous. This is Tops Baseball is the leading brand in the hobby for the past 70 years. It's really tough to just yeah. erase that and start something new when this is what drew pretty much all of us into this in the first place. So I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, 2024, 2025, 2026, we can see tops products that we can, you know, uh, figure out this whole licensing thing. We can see, you know, uh, really proper tops releases, you know, you, like heritage is a good example. You are already going to stop 75, like you're going to be done there and that's it. Like there's so many yeah. years. I really want to see Tops Heritage up. So it's yeah. you know, really important for this to keep going because uh, there's so much, there's so much that uh, we hold near and dear about Tops and I don't want to see it out of the hobby. It would, it would be a disservice for everybody. Yeah. We are waving the same pennant and rooting for the same thing uh, here. I hope, you know, cooler heads prevail. I hope fanatics realizes Tops didn't do everything perfect. We understand that. Sure. Uh, but 70 years of history, they did a lot of things right, uh, mm -hmm. too. And people uh, fell in love with baseball cards uh, in, in Tops' case and in other sports. But, well, you know, recently the just baseball cards. And uh, I hope they sort of send an olive branch, like you said, uh, to us collectors to say, hey, we realize it's important to you. Uh, one thing that was encouraging, I don't want to, you know, we, we kind of got to wrap it up, but uh, uh, Michael Rubin, the CEO, uh, on a recent interview, when he was asked uh, uh, any potential to buy an existing uh, card manufacturer, he said most likely. So that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that he didn't say either duck the question or say no, probably not, or, or something along no, we're gonna we're gonna do our own thing to to say most likely when he didn't have to uh, no. is is encouraging uh, and uh, hopefully uh, that's that's what happens. Uh, you know, we'll have to we'll have to kind of cross our fingers and uh, see how this all plays out. And it's we're gonna be you know it's amazing how much I've talked about it on this show and yet to talk about it. And like you said, we're a few years away from seeing anything 
uh, of substance uh, from the new agreements. And but uh, that's what we love to do uh, in content creation, and we like to speculate. That's that's all we can do right now, which is kind of give educated guesses. Some of it, uh, I think in both of our cases, what we've said on this episode is a little bit of uh, wishful hoping and thinking to see those five uh, in Topps' case, to see those uh, those brands kind of continue on uh, and those legacies uh, not end. And uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe not everything, but uh, some of the, you know, you mentioned one heritage, which believe it or not, I'm not a big fan of, but I realize, but at the same time, and I realize the importance of that line. Uh, yeah. Just because I don't particularly uh, like it doesn't mean that it's not a huge thing that needs to, to continue uh, on. And uh, hopefully something tells me, and again, I don't want to jinx now, something tells me something's going to, to give. And I, I hope that's uh, uh, that's the case. I want to thank you for, for giving the show some time, uh, talking about uh, your book coming out. Uh, that's in April of 2022. Uh, it's called uh, what Ken Caminiti playing through the pain. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have you back on too, closer to uh, release, and we'll 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 get the, the word out there uh, again. I always give our guests here on Sports Card Nation kind of the the final word. Give out any websites, social media handles, whatever you want to share with those listening, where they can find. Uh, anything you're doing, uh, take your time and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Now, this has been such a pleasure being on this program and talking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, the book is called Playing Through the Pain. It's going to be coming out in the spring. Uh, really looking forward to it. It's available for pre order right now on Amazon and other sites, but obviously next year it will be in bookstores. Uh, in addition to that, I recently started the Substack. It's a uh, dangoodstuff.substack.com uh, and my Twitter is dgood73 uh, so it's been a real pleasure being a part of this and, uh, and talking to you. Uh, no th- no doubt and thank you for, for coming on and I look forward to you know, my, you know I don't think you have to be uh, a Ken Caminiti fan I think this book is going to be very interesting uh, just the same even if you're just a baseball fan or a fan especially of that era uh, in the sport. I think it's going to be a very important piece. And uh, uh, like you said, probably should have been done sooner, but uh, better late uh, than never. And we're we're going to get it uh, in April and looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks. That's Dan. Good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Take care. We'll, We'll see you soon. You too. What doesn't one of one car shop do? From box, case, and personal brakes, there's always fire being pulled. They offer bulk grading subs, and their large store located in Strongsville, Ohio, offers an incredible selection of sports cards, non-sports, and authentic autograph memorabilia. Steve and family will treat you right. Check them out on Instagram at one of one card shop or on the web at oneofonecardshop.com. That's going to do it for another episode of Sports Card Nation. Thank you all out there who make this show possible as we begin our fourth year. It's crazy. Never, you know, when we started this thing, I I had no idea how long it was going to go, where it was going to go, what it was going to develop into, and and here we are. I want to thank my guest today. Man, great conversation, Mr. Dan Good. Uh, You know, looking forward to that book uh, in April. Definitely a must read and again you don't have to be a Ken Caminiti fan an Astros fan a Padres fan I think if you're a baseball fan you're going to find this book uh, very interesting a a great error of baseball and sort of a not so great error in baseball when it comes to some of the scandals and whatnot but it's still you know America's pastime if you will and a great sport and uh, a lot of stories uh, from that uh, era, that decade, and I'm sure some of them are going to be uh, talked about in this book, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to to reading it. And you know, you you heard Dan talk about spoke to over 400 people uh, in the process of putting this book together. That's a lot of people. So let, let to give you some perspective, right? This show's been on three years, and I've interviewed 90 different people or somewhere 
uh, in that vicinity. So 400 people is, you know, a lot of people. And uh, it's going to be a lot of insight, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff uh, uh, in that book. And, uh, again, looking forward to it. And I appreciate Dan coming on. Not only talking about the book, but talking about the hobby uh, as well. He's a, he's a card collector uh, to boot. So, uh, uh Glad to have him on. I thank uh, him for giving uh, the show some time. So uh, we're on the year four. It's been a, an incredible journey. Uh, hopefully there's many more years to come. Uh, if I have anything to do about it, uh, there will be. And uh, again, I can't say thank you enough for everyone out there that made uh, the first three years uh, what they turned out to be. And uh Thank you from the bottom of my heart. So uh, with that being said, uh, be well, take care. We'll see you soon. And remember, the hobby is the people.